Please welcome today's speaker, Shridhar Vimbo. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, last time we, we met in uh, San Francisco, you told me that it's hard to differ differentiate between uh, company personality and your personality. So f eventually your personality is what particularly, is the culture. This is particularly yeah. true. This is particularly true for bootstrap companies that are, I mean, I've been long enough and I've been running this company for 22 years and, and uh, from the earliest employees, people know me. So in a sense, the personality of the company and the personality of the founder go together. As an example, I declared a couple of days ago, I mean, we were talking about some marketing campaigns, all of that. I said, look at the company like IKEA, the practical, affordable product they give you. Really good product, practical and affordable. And that is our personality more. I'm an IKEA person, right? I go to IKEA still. Versus you maybe an expensive Swiss watch. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not my personality. That's not what I am. I mean, I've never bought a Swiss watch. I've never spent $20,000 or something on a watch. But that's a different personality. It's not that that's a wrong company. I'm just saying that you have to decide what is your personality, what you like, and then eventually that company has to act in accordance with that personality and that sort of the DNA, so to speak. So when you have that personality for yourself, which is very modest, you're not chasing, you're not scratching your ego, it's I need a bed, I need to sleep, very basic needs. How do you still chase the big goals for your yeah. company? So how, how does it come together? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. We actually are, a, today if you look at our product portfolio, if you go to zoho.com, you'll see it's an intensely ambitious company. There's a lot we are doing that we are taking on some of the biggest players in this business, Microsoft and Google, all of them. Salesforce and so you are the way I see it is I don't in other words those things don't have to all win for me to feel go to bed at night and sleep well I have detached myself from that as those are things you do that's a business necessity and how to to succeed and when it succeeds I have mission like the education I do a lot of R&D. Actually, you asked me what I was doing in the hotel room. I was looking at some code, believe it or not. It was my personal passion. I'm, I still look at code and because I, I have some ideas on how to improve the code. So I work with some engineers in the company closely. But that is that kind of, uh, what is your personal passion? Whatever it is that you do. But you also have to have a business strategy. How do you stay viable, stay vibrant, stay long term to serve your customers and achieve the, the broader goals for employees and the community, right? See, the company is part of a community. That's often forgotten. I mean, uh, a company is not some isolated entity. There is, there's employees that are crucial part of it. And then there's the broader community, their families, all of that. So, for example, we have set up a school for our employees, children. So these are all things. Reason is, particularly in India, where I'm from the school admission is a major pain. Good schools, I mean, you cannot get admission. So we, we set up our own school so that they, they are guaranteed admission. <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. And is, is there a trick uh, which you would recommend how to learn that happiness? It, it, was there a change in your life which caused you to learn to be happy from what you have or it's just something that you it's have? Uh, yeah, at, uh, maybe I look back 20 years ago and now, the thing that I have become is more patient. I'm not as, uh, uh, and so I, I was always patient, but now I've become more patient. <laughs> It's useful to learn because you know it's uh, it it you that way it, it's useful to have for example look at your own daily emotional state. In fact, I once proposed. I mean, I have a small app where you record your state of your mind. I'm happy, cheerful, optimistic, pessimistic, angry, confused, whatever. Record these. Maybe put 20 choices and just just quickly touch one choice, I mean, like this. 
the benefit of that is over time you will see patterns. You will see that your mind has a habit of looping through the same thing over and over and over again. It's like software, it's caught in a loop. <laughs> if you know how to train your mind to go from say an angry state to a happy state or a neutral state and most of us never realize that that's actually a choice we have. I can be very angry and I can train my mind to say no, let's fix it, let's not be so angry now. If you can do that, that is a key benefit. Then a lot of other things come from it. That's the key to me. Mm -hmm. and then once you have that, you have patience. And in my case, it was also helped along by the fact that I have a son with autism. And that's a totally different dimension of challenge, right? It's not, I mean, it's not the, nothing in business comes close to these kind of personal challenge. As treatments and you have to, and you are heartbreaking, seeing him struggle through things, all of that. He's making progress now. The good news is he's much better now than he was five years, ten years ago. But those are things that also, in a way, that helped me build more patience. Because you have to be patient. What else do you do? I mean, when you have a problem like this, when you have something like this, life throws at you. You cannot run away. What do you do? Yeah. So you have, to, you have to face it. Then you put the business problems in perspective. That's another key word, perspective, you know. You, this is an exercise I do. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll go, either if possible I'll do it or visualize myself doing it. Go to some place where nobody knows you, unknown town, where your concerns, your particular whatever that you are stuck in, look remote. Hmm. And that kind of minimizes the problems we face, mm -hmm. actually. The distance brings perspective, they say, right? That's really true, I have found. And you want to be able to bring that perspective taking. Whatever it is that we face today, as they say in Buddhist terms, that will pass. And learn to put that in a broader perspective. And the way I joke with people, okay, it's whatever happens in 100 years, we're all dead, right? <laughs> let's, not, let's not worry about this so much now. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. All of us, all of us, 100 years, we are gone, right? So, it's perspective. <laughs> all right. And I guess uh, a lot of that also comes out when you're burned out. Uh, so when you don't have enough sleep, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, how do uh, you... That's important. Actually, I'll tell yeah. you, I have noticed whenever I'm feeling sad about something, just sleeping, I wake up, I forgot what I was sad about. <laughs> Seriously, I've noticed. <laughs> It's sort of that the whole mood sh seems to shift. So many times I've noticed, I mean, this is our advice, you can try it. Lack of sleep alone puts us in bad moods often that we don't recognize the cause of. So one thing I still, for example, I even now, I'll avoid coffee after like 2 or 3 p.m. Because it will can inter subtly interfere with sleep. So I care so much about the sleep that I, after 2 p.m. I'll not have coffee. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love coffee, but I know that it can screw up with sleep. So these are things that you, small things, but you want to fix it because if you don't get enough sleep, the accumulation of those puts you in, in frames of mind where you can end up making a mistake or bad decisions. So. Right. And when you bootstrap in, there's a lot of pressure on you. Uh, it's not like there is no pressure when you're raising, there's maybe even more. But when you're alone, because you don't have money to hire anyone, uh, how do you manage that work-life balance during the first minus five years? Yeah. I, you know, one way I think about this, for example, there was a, recently there was an entrepreneur conference in Chennai, just about a month ago I was talking to, somebody raised a question about some big topic and I said, there were people who were serving us, the, the hotel wait staff, right? I said, look at these people. Let's compare ourselves to them. They have different worries. Enough money to live in an expensive city, all of those things. We don't have those worries. Do we ever ourselves keep, think ourselves in comparison to them, how much better off we are? We never do that. We only compare ourselves to somebody who seems to have everything. 
but nobody has everything trust me nobody has everything there's always somebody will have something that is lacking maybe they don't have a as beautiful a spouse they may not have a, as brilliant children or something you know <laughs> <laughs> something or other somebody is going to have we are going to have something yeah. but we have to learn to appreciate what we have that is something that and when you have that attitude it's in our case for example we have grown and grown and grown the company is getting bigger and bigger and there is a lot more success coming but i've learned to detach myself from craving it it's good and it has good purposes but it's not necessary for me to sleep well at night that's the balance and another perspective right look at the city i mean this is one of the most beautiful cities in the world you are actually all truly fortunate to live here right this is make sure you enjoy that fact <laughs> tell yourself i live in one of the most beautiful cities in the world look at the weather look at all this and and enjoy that go have a cup of coffee in fact i i intentionally walked today mm-hmm. because i enjoyed the walk <laughs> <laughs> i enjoyed the walk yeah. i walked from uh, you know partly about 20 minutes 25 minutes walk i'm still driving you back <laughs> <laughs> i can walk <laughs> uh, and it's exercise too i mean that's how i get my exercise but i enjoyed it i'm 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 looking at the sites and i'm looking at the shops i do a lot of window shopping and just look around even if i never buy anything at least i look at them <laughs> and see oh, it's nice <laughs> so that's learn to enjoy those things those moments because i'm here i could see that how beautiful the city is and that's something that you must enjoy because that's that's then you tell yourself all of those truly how you are fortunate then a lot of the challenges kind of get minimized and it it actually increases the odds of your success because a happy person a balanced person is able to strive longer stay longer at the game right But, but how do you have any kind of uh, time management hack or something that would make you more effective to let you enjoy yeah. because usually you just bury yourself yeah. in in work and how do you do that yeah i i don't watch tv at all mm-hmm. so that's probably the biggest time sinks for a lot of people and the modern day version today's version is like a lot of facebook and stuff <laughs> those are just infinite time sinks right you can get in and Three hours later, it's like junk food for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> you have done done nothing, right? So those are the ways. Learn where your time is completely sunk with no this thing. And if you can control those, I mean, maybe you can enjoy a little bit of junk food, but not too much, right? But if you can control those, then you get a lot of time back. And then you know, how you allocate is like I, for example, I spend. You won't believe it. I spend a lot of time in. deeply technical topics like programming languages that's one of my passions so i spend a lot of time studying it researching it a lot of that but find something like that mm-hmm. that you can do and i of course think about business a lot talk to my colleagues and all that one thing that still this is again part of our company's one of the advantage of bootstrapping is even now with 6000 employees we run a fairly informal loosely knit uh loosely coupled culture where you are not sitting nobody sits in meetings all day not me and not my senior managers not any of our employees i hate that type of thing because it's it's such a time sink it's a drain i have seen that i mean when i worked in a company before i remember my schedule even as a young engineer my schedule was 3 hours a day in meetings and i was supposed to be writing code but 3 hours a day will go on meetings so those are the things i have tried to avoid and that if you avoid those negative things then you get the positive that the time back then you spend it on your passions and and thinking about work and family all of that but just that learn to control those negative time things mm-hmm. and i read also that uh Forbes when they asked to interview you uh, invited you to a restaurant you said yeah, I don't have a time for that to come to my cafeteria we'll sit, we'll sit at Zoho's office and uh, in that interview you also said and she she asked about your personality uh, and uh, you're kind of um, a bit rule breaker 
at least you were when, when you were young. So I'm curious about your attitude of breaking rules or testing boundaries as a bootstrapper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, you are, any new entrepreneurial success breaks some rules or the other. Rule meaning, I don't mean laws. I mean that something that everybody thinks is true, but no longer true. You have to figure out what that is. That's uh, actually a critical part of it. That is what is commonly believed to be true, but is going to change. Hmm. Right? I'll give you an example of such a thing today that's possible, right? I'm, I'm thinking about that. I think about these topics a lot. So, in the last 20, 30 years of, and I have lived long enough to kind of know what was before 20, 30 years. So, <laughs> you tell my age, right? I'm 50. Now, but the 20, 30 years ago, the cities that are like whether New York or even San Francisco were not as hot in terms of all the investment companies, all of that as they are today. In fact, the, I have watched the very definition of Silicon Valley change. Silicon Valley used to mean the suburban Santa Clara, mm. which is nondescript buildings, like single story buildings in suburban Santa Clara or San Jose. Today, Silicon Valley means high-rise towers in San Francisco. This, this change, I saw it happen. When I came to Silicon Valley, I came to Silicon Valley at that time. I didn't come to San Francisco. I came to, my first home was in South San Jose, far 70 miles from San Francisco. So the young, it's not only a geographic shift, mm. there's another shift that happened. At that time, even in Silicon Valley, a lot of companies chose these things because of cheap rent. I mean, our first rent we were paying was a dollar twenty a month for a square foot. Even now, pleasant and where we are, it only goes for about two dollars per square. Hmm. While in San Francisco, it'll go for like seven or eight dollars, literally three times, and it's about a thirty-five mile, I mean, fifty kilometer difference, right? But it's, we like frugal. But today, so one trend that most of the startups have piled on is this big cities with expensive rent, expensive cost of living, all of that. But look at Canada, I mean, there's so much space. <laughs> there's so many cities, so many places to, so you don't have to keep everything in the center of the city, center of the most expensive places. This trend, I believe, will shift. And the reason it will shift is, for a younger generation, particularly those of you who are 30, 35 below, it's become unaffordable now in terms of housing, uh, all of that in cities, major cities now. It's true in San Francisco, it's true in New York, it's true in Vancouver, right? And yet, most growth happens when young people are able to afford a home, actually. That's yeah. where the, that, that is when young people flock in the US, the trend has already started where a reverse migration started. I predicted this to smaller cities now, like Louisville, Kentucky, for example, is attracting migrants from places like New York now, simply because the 30-year-olds cannot afford. I mean, at 22, the city is fun, but at 30, 35, when somebody is thinking maybe I ought to have some children or something like that, at that point, you realize I can never raise children here. I cannot afford the home, I cannot afford the, maybe the education, all of those things. So this trend is something worth betting on. And so you have to realize what trend is currently true, but it will change. That's something that is useful to ask that question. That is why they call me a rule breaker, because I always ask that. Similarly, I believe this trend where everybody has to go to college and get into college debt, that's a trend I believe will shift. In the US already now, there is more and more articles coming up. I'm reading a book called uh, uh, Why College Education is Actually a Waste of Time and Money, written by a college professor. <laughs> written by a college professor, Brian Kaplan. Go read this. And this is a very crucial book. Similarly, there is another trend that I see coming. You know, in the last 20, 30 years, we have become extremely metric driven, and that is said as data driven, metric driven, all of that. Everything, measure and manage, everything. But I think that trend has gone too far. 
we are going to see a backlash. A lot of these are like that, where they shift, the pendulum swings, okay. That's again, I have lived long enough and if you as a young person know which way the pendulum is going to swing and you get ahead of that, that's a lot of fortunes are made there and they'll call you a rule breaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you find your place somewhere, um, you have that element of luck and you said that Zuckerberg probably yeah. would have not started Facebook again if he had nothing. Yeah, that is, that is a good test. So, if you take, for example, Mark Zuckerberg again and he has to start a new website or an app or whatever and make it successful, odds are that the same cannot be replicated. This is not to say he's not a smart person, but the point is the unique combination of things that happened that one time, the same magic does not strike like that. He, I mean, you'd probably be a successful businessman again, but it won't be the same kind of the ride that they had such a short time, right? You'll have to go through a more normal thing. And that is true. So what you can hope for when you bootstrap is, you can best hope for is that slog years, maybe it gets easier, maybe you have some long-term vision, you pursue it and you are on the right side of some trends, that's what the best you can hope for. Anything else like the lottery effect that happens, that's not in your control. And actually somebody asked Bill Gates uh, once in an interview, this one particularly sticks in my mind. Bill, did you think when you started this, this would be so successful you would become the richest man in the world? He said, no, I didn't think that, but I had the confidence that we would at least be a hundred million dollar company. I think that is reasonable actually. That is actually a very good answer. That's what is true for a lot of smart people. That is, they started all over again, they were diligent, they worked hard, they could be reasonably successful. But the scale of the success, is it a hundred million company or a hundred billion company, cannot be predicted. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that uh, that's fair across all industries, B2B, B2C, or B2B can be more methodological and you have that methodology yeah. that can be repeated? B2C, B2C has a lot of elements of lottery, honestly, particularly in the web. You just don't have, I mean, you see the successes themselves and you see how much of an element of the luck or accident in it, time in place, all of that and suddenly it takes off, right? This is true even for, I mean, that you, the, anything that's closer to the consumer, That's the truth. I mean, nobody knows how to make a, reliably make a successful movie too. That's actually the, the, the in fact, I, I give that analogy a lot because a lot of the B2C is like movie making. Hmm. Just because you know, that's why they do these franchise movies where, you know, two, three, all that because the, once they got a hit, they want to milk it. Because it's, they know how hard it is to get a hit like that. And it's true. In B2B, uh, B2C is like gold digging that way, gold mining. You dig for gold, you hit it big, I mean, not big. B2B is more like fisherman. <laughs> You're diligent, you go fishing every day, you can catch some fish, you hope to catch some. Some days you'll be lucky, some days won't be so lucky. But, you know, if the fish are out there, you're going to catch some. The fish are out there, right? So that's the the way that you have to think. So B2B is that way. But you have to have the temperament again in both. If you are going to be, a lot of B2B is, it's not to minimize the talent involved, but it is to say that if 100 people with equal talent start these B2B things, maybe a couple of them hit it that way. That does not make the 98 remaining 98 dumb, just not lucky, that's all. So, specifically looking at the methodology that you have, because your guys, some of your guys founded this Zoho Mafia and they went yeah. on to found their venture. Today, so there is some knowledge. Can of you, course. Can yeah, you share some knowledge, some yeah, tips, yeah, yeah. specific tips? Actually, those are, those are contextual knowledge about how to build the product, how to build software, how to take care of customers, all of that people learned. Today, 
VCs have pumped about 400 million into the Zoho ecosystem now, actually, as of today. That is, people who have left Zoho to found other companies have raised about 400 million dollars as of now. That's the scale at which it's uh, gone. And of course, VCs would give us a billion dollars today if we went for it. But the, the, in fact, one of the reasons they are doing that is they tried very hard to get into Zoho. I have said, no, I'm not interested. So they tried to persuade one of the managers, you come, we'll <laughs> persuade. And that's fine. I mean, I, you know, it's a free, free country. People, people should have the right to do what they, their hearts dictate, right? The thing, what, what they like about Zoho, what VCs like about Zoho is, a lot of managers have real expertise, building product, shipping product, taking care of customers, uh, building revenue, all of that. And these are the things that I talked about, the bootstrapping, the initial years themselves. There isn't any, I cannot teach you in a classroom all this because only when you build a product and you ship it, you learn some lessons. All these, this is another reason for my educational mission is, most of these lessons are what I call contextual and experiential. Not something that can be written down in a book mm. and taught in a classroom. That's the truth. It gets because you, as you go through it, you discover things. Mm. And how you react to those, that's what sets you on. That is what VCs are valued because these people have gone through. Like five years, seven years, they have spent a over ten years. They would have built up that crucial reservoir of that experience that the VCs are trying to tap. All right, let's take some questions from uh, the audience. Who will be the first one? Go ahead. I'm um, just curious, what was the North Star or core mission that has driven Zoho from the beginning? Yeah, my initial thought was this was the trend that wasn't true, but I thought it would be true. If you go back and look at the 90s, India started exporting a lot of software down. That's when it started happening. That's about 92, 93, 94, that's when it started happening. I myself graduated college in 89, okay? And even in my year, it wasn't, a lot of people didn't go abroad. But soon thereafter, maybe within two, three years, there's a lot of software talent, particularly in Silicon Valley, all these places, and of course, some found its way to Canada. I realized that well, there's a lot of potential in India, but nobody is building companies here. Nobody has seen the, the, the opportunity to build when there's so much talent. Boom. So I said, I mean, even if a lot of people are exporting, India has 1.3 billion people. I mean, could tuck in Canada and, 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 and not have. <laughs> so I thought that there's so much talent pool here and you ought to be able to build some substantial companies, significant companies. So that was the thesis, operating thesis. And it's still true, by the way, it's still true. So you have to find that kind of what is your, uh, it need not be a big one in the beginning, but you discover it over the course of your thing. But this is what my, I remember thinking at that time. And this, by the way, at that time, the same thing happened in China, right? Look at companies like Alibaba or companies like Tencent. I remember Baidu, how much of a struggle it was in the early days for them. I remember this company, I remember Huawei, actually. Huawei is now a $50 billion networking company from China. And we, we worked closely with them because we were in the networking business, right? At that time when we were working with them, Huawei had probably about 300, 400 engineers. I remember that time. They came to Chennai, varsity. We cooperated on some projects at that time. They were much tiny company, now they are 50 billion. But the thesis there is, there is a trend, massive trend, China's emergence they were tapping into. So it's useful to have such, some kind of a thing that you identify what is commonly it need not be very big, but at least something, there is a dislocation you see. Because any new substantial thing requires such a dislocation to succeed because otherwise the incumbents are all too powerful. They have all the strengths, right? Why should somebody buy your offering when there are so many incumbents? 
So that's where the dislocation happens. And if you can project it and even have an inkling of what is coming, that could be a big start. Thank you. Yes, go, go ahead. Um, do you have any tips on how to manage this ride, especially the big stabbing ride with your co-founder? Co-founder, yeah. Me actually, I have uh, five co-founders, two of them are with me, two of them branched off on their own new ventures. We are on good terms and they branched off into new after about 10 years after we became reasonably successful, they went and started new companies. It's good to find people who are not very egoistical, ego-driven. It's good to have some alignment of values. What are you in there for? What are they in there for? That's important. Actually, true story, in 99, this was about three years after we started, this was the bubble time. There was a massive bubble in Silicon Valley. There was a company that approached us and they wanted this niche product that we have. They offered us $25 million. I mean, we were a tiny company, but they offered us $25 million for it. And, I mean, it would be tempting, right? We are, we are nobodies. We have zero. I mean, we are... We have, a, we have some revenue, but we are not a big company. We, we don't, and we are not independently wealthy. I remember having a meeting with my co-founders and said, first, who wants to sell? Nobody raised their hand. I said, who would have any regret if we screwed up and it all went to zero? <laughs> Could happen, right? We decide not to sell. Five years later, we are dead. And then we'll have mutual recommendation, right? You are the one who screwed it up. It said, look, if it goes to zero, we are fine. And you know what? The truth is, in this entire time, my co-founders, nobody said, let's go raise lots of money, let's go do all this, because there was an alignment of those values. That is actually important. So that is, I think, more key. And if then it said, you are going to have differences, you are going to have arguments, debates. But if there is some fundamental alignment of these values, then you can, you can move through. If you have fundamental misalignment of those, or objectives, where you want to get to. And I actually remember one of our early people had a goal in life. He said, I want to get rich in two, three years. I don't have patience. That person ended up leaving in two months, actually. Hmm. Yeah, he ended up leaving in two months because he saw that it's a slog. Hmm. Funnily enough, I met him a year ago, <coughs> accidentally in some event. And he said, only you and I know the story. And I hope you never say anyone who I am, but I've always regretted this now. <laughs> like, well, that's a sad part, right? I mean, he actually never really became rich, by the way. That's the problem, right? But he was in such a rush at that time. And I remember telling him, you know, hey, I don't know when we'll all get rich. You cannot forecast these things. You have to have patience. But he didn't have that. Right? Mm. So these are the kinds of alignment issues I talk about. You have to have that alignment. So you cannot convince somebody to change their fundamental worldview. That's like asking them to change their religion. So you have to have some alignment on those religious questions. I see. Yeah. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, you mentioned about how you've had some really good engineers or some very good talent people who didn't go to get amazing grades in amazing schools. So what do you look for when you, when you hire? Yeah. So we now increasingly we are moving towards, particularly when we hire fresh recruits, what they call these uh, work sample test studies. We hire them on a kind of a temp project for a month or two, and then we make them permanent employees. That's a lot of our hiring is based towards that. And obviously somebody with an experience with a current job wouldn't want to do that. But the bootstrapper, you're not going to get those people, realistically. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Mostly you have to settle for people who otherwise would not have gotten a job easily. That's your first employees, always. Again, it's good to have those realistic ideas. Why would somebody want to work for me? Not in a bad way. It is a way that I don't have a lot of money to offer. I don't have a lot to offer. I don't have prestige to offer. Right? Why would somebody still want to work? Maybe because they are desperate for a job. And then within that, how do you find the right people? So these kinds of like trial for a year, month. We actually pay them, but they understand that, look, prove yourself. 
month or two, you show us what you got, then hire you. That, our hiring rate, hit rate on those is about 50-60%. So it works out well, actually. Because the attitude of sticking through it itself shows that the person maybe has something they can offer you. There are people who don't stick through this, right? A lot of times I've seen, a lot of failures are people who simply just don't stick with anything. They just flip from one to the other. And so people who know who can stick through something, they already have an advantage and those are the kind of people maybe you want to hire. And that way you also are investing in them and when you invest in people, they tend to feel more of a loyalty towards the company than investing in them. And that's important. So these are, that's how I will put it. Okay. So we'll take one, two, any more questions? So three, four? For the last one? No? Okay, so three here. Oh, you go ahead. Go first. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us about like, your first customer and how that journey worked in getting that first yeah. customer and how you balanced building the product for that customer versus building the bigger, bigger solution yeah. that you guys were managing? Yeah, we, early on we did those kind of uh, product projects where the customer wanted us to integrate that into their system and we take on a development project like that. Those are a good source of revenue too. I mean, I remember closing a 250K deal, that is the first one, I mean, and uh, where they paid us for, it was like maybe about six months and we had to work on a lot to integrate our system in, into theirs. It's useful to, for a bootstrapper, those are useful source of revenue. So don't neglect those. But you also have to stay committed to your product vision. And it's a balancing act. It's not easy. But if you at least keep in mind that these are things that I need in the product, these are things I don't need in the product, but this customer is paying for me to do, keep them separate, that could help you. Or maybe you have a couple of people dedicated to this, a couple of people dedicated to product. We can afford that. And if they are paying you well, maybe you can afford that. See, another thing is, in fact, we are on the other side, right? We have actually paid some companies for work for us now, in the same way. And I'm paying it forward that way. Where I have given projects to sort of small bootstrappers this way because there are some critical things we needed. But we pay them to integrate into our systems because that's, that becomes a critical thing for us. Because the technology sitting on the shelf is useless. But only they know that technology well enough to do all this work. For us to go and master all the nuance right now would be a waste of time because it's their technology. So we pay them to do this. So those kind of things can be actually good for the bootstrapper and it's good for the company that's buying your product plus the service. Later on, hopefully you will have enough repeat that you are, the projects can be done more easily by third parties or themselves. But initially, it's better for you to do it. So. All right, so there were two last questions here. Yeah, go ahead. So first, thank you very much for a very thank positive you. and talk. Thank you. My question, my question is to the co-founders. You need the patience, you need to start from minus five. With your co-founders, did you have an equivalent um, money to start out with, which is both money to put into the company? Make it happen and, stuff, and money to survive. Yeah, easy. None of us had any money. So <laughs> that was our case was easy. No one had any money. No one had any money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was an easy way so to start. To table, yeah, right? well, you we did like some of these kind of projects, little projects. I actually the my first the pre-venture to Zoho actually failed. That's where I spent my thirty thousand dollars. So I had zero at the point of this company. I, you know, but I took on a project with a, I was in Silicon Valley, I had a project, actually Cisco, it turned out. And that put food on the table for a few months. So those are kinds of things that, in other words, you have to be flexible and adaptive. And actually those habits have stayed with me, you know. That's why I don't, I don't, I mean, one of the reasons I don't have much of an ego is, 
I know I had to do a lot of these things to survive. You know, why? What's the big deal? I'll still do it if I had to. <laughs> so that is why I think that you, you, with, in our case, that was the truth. Some cases, maybe somebody has money. Then that person has obviously, when somebody brings his money, they always have a more of a say in these things. They they end up. The way typically leadership establishes in these startups is whoever has a vision, drive, ability to persuade the customer, ability to persuade people, they end up becoming the leader. In other words, in our case, for example, all of us started out like it's a team of equals. But at some point, one of our co-founders said you should become the CEO. You have the drive, you are you are the one who's going and persuading our own. So those are the skills that because ultimately you are, there's another analogy I'll give. Founding these kind of companies is like founding a religion in a way, in a sense. And you are persuading people to join your religion. Customers are employed. Imagine that, starting a church and asking people to attend. That's hard, right? So that is, that requires those skills of persuasion, making the case, all of that. And that is what such leadership. So it's not just about money, who brings the money, it's also about those questions. Hopefully, your founders all have the right wisdom to elect the person who can do this. And if those things lead to clashes, then there's a problem, right? And usually there has to be a consensus on, hey, this person can lead. But that happened, in our case, it happened over two or three year period, actually. I wasn't the quote-unquote founding CEO, I'm one of the founders. But our other founders said that you should go do this because you are the, I joke maybe, you so you told me I'm the best bullshit artist in the <laughs> area. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, but they, they'll, in a, in a, in a, Jovial moment, of course, they'll agree. Yeah. You bullshit better than all of us. <laughs> yeah. I would call it just evangelizing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, so there was a last question here. You, uh, you've grown a company, and you talk a lot about how your personality becomes sort of the company's personality. How do you maintain that sort of personality when you're bringing on people, especially in the beginning? Because if you're going from six to ten, you just took essentially yeah, double, yeah. double it. Exactly. How do you keep that that's a, uh, yeah. See, what tends to happen is you have, uh, at least in my experience, companies grow by a process of accumulation where people come on board. Over time, people sort themselves into, I believe in this, I like this, versus, you know, I don't really care. They tend to leave. So, over time, it, it's again like the church example. Whether do you continue to go to the church or not, that kind of thing. Right? Or they do that, that the church offer you enough to keep you there. So it's the same thing. And that process over time is how you accumulate. And it, there is an inbuilt process of the believers staying on and the non believers moving on. Right? So therefore, that is how the personality forms, actually. Because somebody who has no belief at all in what you do, or you as a leader, they tend not to stay too long. And rarely only they will stick around and then be a pain, but mostly they will move on. And it's good for them too, I mean, you know, I always, I joke that if you choose to go to a church, you know, you, you better believe in that God, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you made a choice to go there. Having, going there, why, why not believe? Huh? So, so that's, what, that's how the DNA forms, actually. Yeah. Um. I'm curious, why are you doing this tonight with us? What's your personal drive behind being yeah. here? Because your time worth a lot, and we appreciate you being here, sharing this knowledge, but what, what drives you? Yeah, it's a, this is what they call the paying it forward, right? I, I'm now old enough that I see that. Maybe there's a, one selfish idea is that I want people to discover that paths are discovered. Maybe a similar thing that they'll be fruitful. It's a kind of a religious thing, that, right? I, I liken it to religion. People, you want people to discover your religion. <laughs> <laughs> that may be a motivation. But the second is that 
engaging a lot of people it also helps us as a company maybe you will discover in our company and you will use our tools for your business that is another motivation and then you are also by doing these i actually hone my own skills to engage hmm. to keep doing this and that's how it comes by the way i was a again true story i was a lousy presenter i had no skill at all i could not speak in public all these i had to learn by doing now i am you know having done this for 15 years now i'm i'm getting somewhat better at this like you invited me then <laughs> after hearing that so that also you know this is how you hold you do it and again if you have to be a leader of a company you have to be able to persuade you have to do this that's a essential skill i don't see how you do this without that because you have to have somebody believe and it's hard right customers have to believe employees have to believe neither of that is easy so there is an aspect of that religious mission and leadership now this and that's so i'm a natural at this now i've become mm-hmm. guru and in fact i said If I were born maybe 500 years ago or 1000 years ago, I would have become a religious leader probably. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it's what happened, right? But today we call these these many religions as companies now. Sometimes they call them cults, but it's not. I mean, look, you have to again from an employee perspective also. It is more fun to work for a company with a mission and a purpose because we are I mean, beyond our. basic needs all that actually this is the this is a true study in fact it's a pl- place particularly to canada beyond about 70000 dollars a year that's the number they have come up with somewhere i saw up to that point having more money makes you happier because i mean when you have only 20000 dollars a year you don't have enough money mm-hmm. to live in good city all of that but beyond the point and 70000 was the number i read it could vary maybe in vancouver it's 100000 i don't know it's expensive city right but beyond the point the amount of money does not materially make you any happy this would be true for your employees too right beyond the point just money alone will not make them happy in fact our attrition rate is not proportional to just the the lowest paid people leave the highest paid people don't leave it's not true it has to do with this belief belief in the mission all of those things in fact so that means that from your perspective you have to be able to communicate a mission and you have to be able to have a mission you have to be able to believe in it yourself all of those things are important yeah and these things don't i mean when you are trying to put food on the table all these are abstract things but when you are at 50 people 100 people when you are beyond these stages these things matter more and more Would that be the most important thing you would uh, like the audience take them with them today, or is there any powerful advice uh, you would like to give uh, before we depart? Yeah, keep always be hopeful, optimistic, because it's only optimists who end up creating these companies. Pessimists don't. Pessimists, right? So cultivate that attitude of optimism. but realistic optimism right not delusional optimism <laughs> some of us have that problem we ought to be realistic you ought to be able to laugh at yourself you ought to be able to know look i don't i don't care if somebody calls me a bullshit artist right i don't care i, mean, I laugh at it myself yeah maybe i'm a good bullshit artist too right <laughs> but you have to have that essential optimism in you that's core and keep hope alive and you know keep the perspective as said try to minimize the minimize in a relative sense of the challenges that come because then you are able to face them you are able to and then remind yourself remember how i thought that was so painful at that time i actually still tell this to my engineers sometimes my managers i know you are going through this is a very tough situation now trust me though Three months later, you look back. This won't look that big. And they come and tell me, "You are right. Now it's three months. It doesn't look that big." Write that down and keep that in mind because this is the actually there is an essential Buddhist attitude. It's that it will pass. Mm. Three months later, you will think something different, and you, this won't be as big a deal. 
So that attitude then will cultivate it will keep going. Yeah. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.